Oh, <laughs> hey, I didn't see you there. I'm just reading this book on H.P. Lovecraft. I'm not really familiar with him, with his work, but it's so famous, I thought I'd get a book and read about it. I'm reading a story, I only just started, um, a story in here called The Temple, and it's about some uh, German U-boaters in the, you know, during the, the First World War. And it's written from the point of view of the captain, who is uh, a Prussian. And there's a line here, it says, I thought of poor Klenza and wondered where his body rested with the image he had carried back into the sea. He had warned me of something and I had not heeded, but he was a soft-headed Rhinelander who went mad at troubles a Prussian could bear with ease. Wow, that's a quite a diss on the Rhinelanders, huh? There was another quote about that too. Yeah. Lieutenant Clenza seemed paralyzed and inefficient, as one might expect of a soft, womanish Rhinelander. <laughs> wow, some epic burn on Rhinelanders there. That gives me an idea. Since you're here anyway, might as well do a video about Rhinelander. Rhinelander. What do you think? Should we do a Board Gems video? Why not? Now, this is a little bit of an obscure game, so I think it's a good fit for Board Gems. It's called Rhinelander, and it was designed by Reiner Knizia, and it was published way back in 1999, so it's over 20 years old, and it was actually published originally in Germany um, by Parker Brothers. The English edition was from face-to-face -face games. They're, they publish games in English. Um, they're not around anymore, I'm pretty sure. Um, I know they did a few of uh, the Knizia older games like a Winter Circle and, and this one. So this one, I think they published it around mid-2000s. So a few years after, after this originally came out in Germany. Um, it's for three to five players, ages 12 and up according to this box. Now, younger kids could definitely play it, but it's a little dry, so um, they might not enjoy it uh, as much as an adult would. And the box says 45 minutes to play, which I would say is pretty accurate, maybe a little bit longer. Now, this is an interesting game. I really like this game, which is why I'm covering it as a board gem, because I think it's a board gem, and it's my video series. You get your own video series. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm Canadian. I have to apologize for that for that outburst. I, I find this a really interesting game. It bears similarities to some other games, um, including Acquire, a game from the 1960s. Um, but it's not a money game. There isn't really money in the game. Uh, so you, there's no buy actions. You're not paying out money. You're just paying out points. So in some ways, it's a lot, it feels a lot like Acquire, but it's kind of even more kind of streamlined. It doesn't have that money theme. It's just about getting points. Uh, so it's it's actually really approachable. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a subset of gamers who really like Acquire, and if they tried this, this would become one of their favorite games too. Um, it has a lot of similarities, and it's a really dynamic game, and I, I really enjoy it. So since we're here for Board Gems video anyway, why don't I cover this game, show you how it plays first, and afterwards I'll go over why I think it's a Board Gem. To set up the game, place the board on the table between the players. You're going to take these, what are called bishop tiles, there should be seven of them, and just put them in a stack here, as well as the bishop. Look at that magnificent pawn. So he's going to go right there. You're going to shuffle up this deck of cards. The cards are numbered 1, 2, I believe 54, and there's also a joker. Um, if you see the joker, just leave them out for now. Shuffle up the rest of the cards and give each player five. And then this card, if the players draw this card, just set it aside and draw a replacement. But at the end, you're gonna shuffle that back in. The, just, the gesture is just to um, let people know when it's time to reshuffle the deck. There's a bunch of round discs. These are churches, these are castles, and these are cities ranging in values from two to four. So these are all gonna be mixed up and placed face up on each of the round spaces on the board. 
Each player also starts with three walls. I call them walls. In the rule book, they're called bastions. And each player starts with three of these. There should be 15 in the box. And finally, each player gets a number of discs and dukes in their color. So these are the dukes. And these, according to the rules, are knights, but I find that confusing because these look knight-ish. So I just call them discs. And you're actually going to set a uh, sum aside based on the number of players. So in a three player game, we're going to use all the pieces, but you're gonna take some away for a four or five player game. Check the rules for that. And the game will end on the turn when one player has placed all these discs. The last thing is you have these, which are victory points. I think the rules call them money, but you never buy anything with them. They're just points at the end of the game. Just have a pile of them nearby. The goal of the game is to have the most points, and you get points by taking control of duchies. You're gonna use these markers to represent control of these spaces on the board. And you'll see the spaces are numbered along the river, one to 54, and each river space that's numbered has on either side of it a bit of land, it's shore. And you'll see in some cases where the river forks, they have land on both sides. But here, for example, uh, this land space is actually shared by both 51 and 52. These discs are going to be going on those spaces, mostly on the land spaces, but they can go on the water as well. And discs next to each other, if there's at least two discs next to each other, that forms a duchy. It doesn't matter whether it's the same colored or another player's discs, as long as there's at least two, there's a duchy. And as soon as one player has at least two markers in a duchy, this is one duchy now, and they have more than any other single player, they get to add a duke. And now they are shown to control that duchy. This duke can be removed Yellow or other players can try to kick him out, but he will immediately score points when he's removed. Otherwise, he'll stay there, and at the end of the game, if he's still there, he will score points. More points, in fact, than if he was kicked out. So that's how you get points, by taking control of duchies. In order to take control of duchies, you will play cards. So each player has a hand of cards. Again, there's one card each for the values 1 to 54. Each of these cards represents one river space. Now on a turn, a player simply plays one of the cards from their, uh, from their hand, and it'll go into a discard pile there. They'll place a knight, or sorry, they'll place a disc. Okay, I gotta be careful with my terminology. And then they'll draw a replacement card. And if that replacement card is a jester, then they would draw a replacement for the jester, shuffle all the discards into the pile, shuffle the jester in as well. Now, when you're playing a card, you can do one of two options. When you play the number, you can place a knight on a land space next to that number. So in this case, it's a 47. Blue, playing this, could place a marker either on this space or this space. One of the two. If they're both occupied, like so, for example, then a player who plays a 47 can place it in the water space. But generally speaking, you don't do, you don't do that unless all the land spaces adjacent to it are occupied. The water is the, the last, always the last space occupied. And once all of those spaces are occupied, this card actually is not useful at least that value is not useful anymore in number 47. But there's a second way you can use a card. If you already have markers somewhere on the board, you can play a card, ignoring the number, and do what's called a reinforcement. And a reinforcement is simply placing a marker on a land space, it's always a land space, next to one of your existing markers and not next to any other player's markers. So blue, for example, could play the 16, even though 16 is way over here, he could use this for reinforcement 
and place it adjacent to one of his existing markers, there or there, for example. If another player has a marker, like so, you can't use reinforcements to do that. You can only place a reinforcement next to your own marker and not next to any other player. So the other space on the other side of it has to be blank, has to be empty. Or I guess it could be occupied by the other player. I think that's valid too. Yeah, the same player. Then you could play a reinforcement and go in the middle like that. Now, whoever has control of a duchy, like so, for example, will have a duke next to it. They immediately get to put a duke down. And now they control that duchy. But later on, through other play, perhaps yellow, for example, is manages to connect up, for example, or maybe does this. And then later on, you know, maybe something like this. Now, this is all one duchy and yellow has control. So blue is actually kicked out and yellow will go in. But when blue gets kicked out, blue gets points. And he gets points based on the value of his duchy before yellow took over. And the value of a duchy depends on these markers. So we'll talk about what these markers do. The, the castles and the churches have special abilities, which I'll explain later. But for the purpose of scoring, they're worth one point each, and the cities are worth two to four points. So right now, this duchy is worth one, two, three, and four. The duke itself is actually worth one point. And you see these markers are next to the duchy. Each of these markers is next to, adjacent to, two spaces. So as soon as a marker is next to a piece, it's, that piece is considered, that marker, this city or church, is considered to be part of that duchy and contributes to the value of that duchy. So right now, this duchy is worth four points. One for the church, two for the city, and one because it has a duke. So that's four points. And if yellow manages to play this marker, such that now yellow has the most markers in the duchy, a tie is not enough. So like this, blue would still retain control, but if yellow is able to connect this up, then yellow gets to kick blue out, but blue scores the points for their duchy. So in this case, one, two, three, four, blue would get four points and get his duke back. And now yellow comes in here. And now yellow doesn't score any points immediately, but if somebody kicks her out, then certainly she will get points at that time. Or if the Duke is still there at the end of the game, at the end of the game, we score all the duchies that are on the board. And this time, each Duke is not worth one point, it's worth five points. So if this is what a duchy looked like at the end of the game, it would score one, two, three, plus five, eight points, and yellow would score eight points. So you, it is good to control duchies at the end of the game because you'll score the most points, but there's no reason not to try to get points during the game as well. So as you'll note, the cities and churches each score one point, but they each have a special uh, ability. As soon as a player places a marker next to a castle, something happens this castle then becomes part of a duchy. If the marker is alone, just by itself, one marker by itself is not a duchy. It always needs at least two markers to be a duchy. But a single marker by itself, immediately that player gets to put a marker in the castle. And now it's two markers, and so blue would be able to add a, a duke to it. If there's already a duchy, like so, for example. So blue already has a duke in here. Well, let's say it looked like this. So blue already has a duke in here. And then a player adds a marker like so. We look and see who controls this duchy. And in this case, it's blue. So blue gets to add a marker in here. But later on, and this counts. So now blue has four markers in here and it's harder to dislodge blue. 
But if somebody is able to dislodge blue, then this marker would come off and get replaced by a, a marker of the color of the new duke. Now the order of that is important. Let's see if I can construct an example here. Let's say it looks something like this, okay? Now blue adds a marker here, so blue becomes a duke like so. Red is able to add a marker to this, play to 41. The duke doesn't change because it's a tie, so the duke stays as it is. Now let's suppose red adds a marker here to 45, bringing this castle in. Well, red is about to take control of this duchy, but we look at the castle first. And what do we do? Who controls this duke? Who has the duke there right now? It's actually blue. So blue puts a marker in here. This happens before we reevaluate this. So blue puts a marker in there, and now we evaluate. Well, it's three blue, three red, so blue maintains control. Now, normally markers can't be dislodged. Once a marker is in there, it's there pretty much for good. But there is one exception to that, and that's where the churches come in. As soon as a church gets added to a duchy, like this one is here, there should be seven churches. So the duke, the player who has the duke in that duchy, would take one of the bishop markers and put it on there like so, put it under, under their duke marker. And even if later on this expands and includes another church, there's still only the one bishop. So right now yellow has one bishop. Whenever one player has more bishops than any other player, uh, bishop tiles rather, they get this bad boy, the archbishop. Now the player who has this has one big benefit. Is they're actually able to replace markers on the board. Yellow, if yellow had this, yellow could play a 27 and instead of having to put it over here or use it for reinforcement somewhere on the board, could actually use this archbishop to kick out an existing marker. So this could be very powerful, especially late in the game when there's lots of markers on the board. And at the end of the game, whoever has this marker will score five points. Each player also gets three walls at the start of the game. After a player plays a card, but before they draw a replacement, they're allowed to play one of their three walls. You can place a wall on any empty land space on the board. So you can't place it on water, but you can place it on land. And in doing so, you prevent duchies from combining. It can only be placed on an empty space, but for example, if red has a big duchy over here and yellow's worried about connecting them, you know, one of the players could actually take a wall and put it in the middle there. A wall stays there for the whole game, and now duchies cannot connect over the wall. Of course, a duchy can still connect over here, and as these spaces you know, fill up, for example, something like this, right? Then later on, it's possible that the duchy can, can combine, but that usually happens near the very, very end of the game. So walls prevent that from happening. They can only go in empty land spaces. So the game continues like this until one player runs out of markers and then you total up the values of all the duchies that are on the board at the end of the game keeping in mind that the score is actually four points more than it would be earlier in the game because each of these dukes scores five points at the end instead of one and total up your points give out these markers as point values and the player with the most points wins that's it you're ready to play Rhinelander. So it bears some similarities to Acquire. And Acquire is a game I happen to already like quite a bit. Um, but it's less fiddly than Acquire, right? Acquire, of course, you're always, um, you're, you're owning stocks or you're part ownership in companies that have payouts. So you're always having to make change and pay cash for stocks and that. So it, that takes a little, a little bit of time, kind of that maintenance of the money. So Rhinelander doesn't worry about that. It's just about giving out points and you can focus on the strategy. I think some people have compared it to Tigris and Euphrates as well. Um, I mean, I can understand because it's also a Knizia game and it's also about having these different areas 
that maybe multiple people have a stake in and then they can merge and then something will happen. But this is much simpler in terms of the strategy uh, than Tigris and Euphrates. Even after I've played Tigris five or more times, I still have a hard time with, okay, so I know the rules, but how do I win? Like, what, what's a good strategy? Like, I can't figure it out. But this one is more straightforward. And so there's a lot to like here, a lot to like. So let's go over some of the things about it. First of all, very simple game to learn. Um, there's strategy, but you can't look ahead too far. You have a hand of cards, and so you'll play a card, do a thing on the board, then you'll draw a card. So you'll know, this, well, I'll still have these cards two, three, four turns from now, so I can do this and then this and then this. Of course, they don't always necessarily help, help you. You're still a, a slave to the luck, right? But there's a lot you can do with the luck that you're given. I, I, find, I do find that a lot of games that have this combination of thinkiness and luck drives some hobbyists bonkers. <laughs> but I love it. I love it. Because the luck part prevents you from looking ahead too much. It prevents you from having a long-term strategy that you start at the beginning of the game and then you try to see it through to the end. It's like, no, it's, you can strategize, but only a little bit ahead, right? Only a few turns ahead. And you, you can get a good look at the board. You can see what's, you know, what to work on. And yeah, okay, you draw cards and those cards don't help you with what you want to do, but of course you're getting other cards and you can do something with those instead, right? Um, so this is really my type of game. They don't really make those types of games much anymore. But for me, if somebody were to ask me, you know, Daryl, what is the, the number one Reiner Knizia game you would like to see reprinted? I might say Rhinelander. Uh, now there's a lot of Knizia games I would love to see reprinted. And a lot have, right? Like Amun Ray has been reprinted recently and, uh, and a bunch of others. Um, I'd love to see uh, Raw the Dice game, which I also did a video of. But uh, this is probably my number one, I would say. Because um, the last edition came out a long time ago, 2005, something like that, like mid-2000s, which is when this English edition came out. I would love to see a new version of this. But don't give it a fantasy theme. And don't put in anthropomorphic animals. Don't set it in outer space. Stop that. <laughs> What's wrong with this theme? This is a fine theme. Yeah, it's not extremely like, oh, I feel like I'm in the Rhineland. No, no, okay? It's it's a glazing of a theme, but it works completely fine. This game has a lot going for it, as I said. One of the things I like about it, too, the board is interesting. Um, it's not... When you just glance at it, it just looks like a river that goes like this, right? Which kind of looks symmetrical-like, but it forks in a few places, and there's some interesting areas where different... Uh, territories, different regions, the spaces on the board are adjacent to each other that in other areas they wouldn't be. Um, so you can learn the board and you can learn kind of its ins and outs, kind of the interest, oh, this part's going to be interesting over here, right? It has a really interesting arc. And this is another thing that it shares with the choir because it really balances the short-term goal with the long-term goals. At the beginning of the game, you have an early target. Often, for example, it would be the four-point cities. Right? If you have cards that help you try to get control of the four-point cities, that's good. You're, 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 um, you're, you got a good, good starting point, right? And so you can work towards that. And by the end of the game, of course, you want to have duchies that score a lot of points, and you want to be the one controlling them because you'll score bonus points if you control them at the end as opposed to in the middle. But you also don't want to turn down points in the middle. This is another thing that it, it, it makes it a good comparison with the choir. Because, you know, I've played games of Acquire where I have focused on the end and I did really well at the end, but in the middle of the game, I had no money to work with. And all I, all I was just, a, I was a spectator for the most of the game. And in the end, I, I totaled up, you know, I got a lot of money at the end, but I didn't win. Why? Because by burning through all my money early in order to aim for the end of the game, I was missing opportunities in the middle to get the little payouts. Right? So in Acquire, it's a balance. You want to get the little payouts during the game, but you also want to work toward the big payout at the end. It's exactly the same in Rhinelander. Don't leave points on the table, right? You want to control duchies early in the game. 
that are worth a lot of points. And if people kick you out, it's not a huge deal um, because you'll still score points for it. You just won't score as much points, as many points as you would if you scored it at the end. Um, but those points are nothing to shake a stick at. You still want to score points in the middle of the game. And of course, it's a back and forth, right? Maybe somebody takes control over you and you're trying to figure out how to get that control back, right? Um, you do want to play this with a fair number of players. So the range is three to five, but it's a Goldilocks game. Um, if you haven't watched other videos in the series, it's a term I've used before. A Goldilocks game is uh, usually an older game and it often has that player range of three to five, but the game doesn't really scale. Like the board, there's a shared board and you're working on the shared board, you're competing with other players for the limited space on the board, but that board doesn't scale for, for the number of players. So when you have a three player game, there's way too much open space. It's too easy to do what you want. But some people would find a five player game to be too, too brutal, too uh, difficult to do what you want because there's not enough elbow room. Um, so in that sense, four is the sweet spot. Not saying it's best with four. I'm just saying that that balance, it's obviously balanced for four players in terms of how much room you have to maneuver. And if you want an, an easier, friendlier game, you can play with three. Or if you want a more challenging game, you play with five. For hobbyists, that translates to you want at least four players for this game. And depending on your tolerance for really challenging, you know, beat each other up kind of games, um, feel free to go to five. But you, you, a hobbyist would be pretty bored with this game for three players. So you want four or five. Next is my rating rebuttal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, bring up some, uh, on an iPad here, I'm gonna bring up some comments from people on Board Game Geek who have rated it four out of 10. And I'm gonna read them out loud and respond to them. I'm not going to attribute them. This is not about making it personal. I'm just, these are just some comments of people who who didn't like the game and I want to share them with you. And if I think they're fair, I'll say so. And if I think they're unfair, I might mention that too. Played twice, didn't like it. Feels too random. Your hand of cards dictates what you can and can't do to a large extent. And after a few rounds, many options become unattractive to useless because of what other players have done. Um, feels too random. You know, uh, that's what you get with a hand of cards. But again, it's what you're doing with your cards. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm a bit repetitive. If you watched my video on like Carolus Magnus, for example, probably there'd be some of the same um, criticisms for that game as for this game, in that it's a thinky game, but it has randomness, right? And for a lot of hobbyists, they don't like that randomness. But the randomness is what makes every game different. And you have to be flexible. You have to be like, okay, these are the cards I'm getting. I can't do what I had hoped to do. It's like, I'm really hoping to get a 40. Like, I didn't get a 40, so now what do I do, right? You don't always have perfect control in real life, and you don't in a game either. Well, some Knizias were bound to become classics, and some didn't. <laughs> the fact that until recently I hadn't heard of this title explains why I think Rhinelander is one of the latter. Okay. Yep, well, that's why I'm covering this video, because it's a forgotten gem. Reading the rules, I expected a more streamlined version of Euphrate and Tigris, but the game felt a bit unbalanced. I don't know about unbalanced. I mean, I don't think, I don't see the imbalance in the game. Playing with five, it seems the starting position and card distribution is too great a factor in determining who does well. Maybe it takes repeated plays to get into the finer tactical details, but it didn't feel like that everyone had an equal shot at winning from the get-go. I mean, if you get a bunch of cards that are kind of close together, I guess that can be a good thing. But keep in mind, um, you can also use any card to kind of expand your duchy. So you don't have to have cards that are just like all adjacent to each other and you're gonna do well, right? You, you can use any cards to expand your holdings. So I, I didn't see what this player saw in terms of the starting position and card distribution. You're kind of choosing your starting position. And it's not like you're, you have to start in that place and then expand from there. You can go anywhere you have the cards for. So there's no, there's really no starting position. The cats are gonna be a little bit noisy, just a heads up. Interesting game of strategy and majorities. A bit too much take that and a sort of direct conflict that I find unpleasant. Maybe too much randomness for the degree of abstraction that the game has, but in general, this is not a bad game. 
Yeah, I mean, it has take that in direct conflict. And it's interesting to see the differences of opinions of, of different types of gamers, because sometimes games can kind of fall through the, cr through the cracks because they're not the ideal version of what people are looking for. And there are some people who want an abstract game, uh, maybe one with a light dose of setting, um, but they feel like an abstract game should should have uh, as little randomness as possible, right? And for but for some gamers, you know, you want randomness because it makes the game more fun, more dynamic. Like, oh, I didn't know you had that card. Oh, you know, now you were able to get in there where I didn't want you to get, right? This has a level of interaction and conflict that a lot of German style games, I'll put it that way, um, that terms I really use anymore, but I'm reclaiming it. So there that a lot of those types of games didn't have. So actually this would appeal to a lot of different people, right? It has simple rules and it's really streamlined and dare I say it, I hate that word, but elegant, yes, this is elegant, but it still has that conflict. It still has the, the butting heads, the interaction. A lot of people claim to love Tigris and Euphrates. Well, this has a lot of what Tigris and Euphrates has, but in the simpler streamlined package. So can't please everyone. Nothing special, I think it could get dry after a couple of plays. I mean, it is a dry game, right? But the cards would at least ensure that every game is different. But yeah, it's not a really a hooting and hollering kind of game. It, it's, a, it's a dry, thoughtful experience, yes. Kind of a dull and theme-stretched mathematical game that doesn't use its wonderful setting to its full potential. Everything is dumbed down to create a bland Euro abstract. Where are the castles with their history? Could it not have been more? Could have been more, could have been more complicated. You could have had stuff where it's like, oh, different castles have different abilities and, and you know, lean into the theme a little bit more, absolutely. Um, but as a, again, a streamlined German style game with conflict, um, this has a lot going for it just as it is. Um, but I mean, like if, it, if they redid this in like a, you know, like a new version in the Kickstarter, maybe as a stretch goal, they could add, you know, like little mini expansions, right? Whereas the base game, all the castles are worth one point and they all do the same thing, but here's a little mini expansion that makes all the castles do different things or gives cards with special powers. Like, I don't mind if those are in the box. Just give me the option to not use them. Played this once at a convention. Didn't care for it much. Too simplistic. Okay, yeah. If you like more complicated games, this is not that complicated. I think of that as a, as a good quality. Simply didn't seem to be enough going on here. Fairly simple area control game that takes longer than justified. Simply feels a bit slow. May have a runaway problem too. Sumeria does it better faster. I haven't played Sumeria. I'm not familiar with it. Um, but if you're interested in this game, maybe check out what this user says. Maybe Sumeria is, is a, a kind of a better version of this game for all I know. Um, I don't know about the runaway problem. I mean, you want your decisions to matter. Right? You don't want the decisions to be like, oh, I do it and it doesn't matter. And in the end, you know, the points are 25, 23, 21. Good game, everybody, but felt like the decisions didn't matter. Like this one, the decisions matter, right? Like if you, you can get into a hole early, it's true. So it's not necessarily a runaway problem per se, because, you know, I don't know. You have to identify the board, see the areas of the board that are worth a lot of points and really fight for those. Area majority slash control is not something I generally enjoy. I don't like the stress of fighting on multiple fronts and getting attacked by multiple people that I can't possibly fend off. There's a political skill of convincing people not to do that that I lack. Rhinelander has this issue. I mean, I don't consider this a negotiation game. I thought, like, don't, don't attack me, attack him, he's winning. I mean, yeah, I guess you could do that, but... I mean, the game supports it if the play style of your group is like that. But if your play style, if your group doesn't like to do that, you don't have to play it that way. It's not part of the game at all, it's sort of that negotiation. But he finds the game stressful. I mean, I guess so, but there's conflict, right? It's compounded by the fact that without the right cards, there's only so much you can do. Disagree on that, because the cards, the cards give you the option of, um, you know, playing at the location, at this space, right, that, that's numbered on the card, or expanding your existing kind of duchy, and both are very, very useful. So I don't find any cards really not useful. 
it's not really that dependent on what cards you get. Although I will say that um, if you have the bishop, um, getting the right cards can just be really good or really bad at that point. Because with the right cards, you can kick other players out. And if you get the right card, then you're doing a lot of damage to people, right? So in that sense, I'd agree with that. The nicest thing about this game for me is the awesome picture on the box. There's certainly a game here, but it's just too dry, abstract, and slow-moving for my tastes. If you enjoy chess or go, this may be your game. Again, it's going to be that in-between, right? So if you enjoy chess or go, you probably won't enjoy this game because you're going to be annoyed by the randomness. For me, the choices are... Okay, so this is... Sorry, this, this is... To me, maybe I'm reading this wrong, or maybe I'm just confused. It seems like this, this user is... Uh, is disagreeing with himself. They say, if you enjoy chess or go, this may be your game, but for me, the choices are too restrictive. And the moves usually are tactical and reactionary. So why would you think somebody who likes chess or go would like it if you think this is too tactical and reactionary and not strategic enough? A person who likes chess or go is not gonna like that. They're gonna want more strategy. Maybe I'm reading this wrong, but that's how I read it. Bottom line, somewhat clever and challenging, just not a lot of fun. Yeah, fun. What even is fun? Fun is different things to different people. Feels kludgy. Didn't like the retention of color, etc. with mergers. Would like to see some VP benefit for not playing blocking castles. I avoided conflict in a five-player game for an easy victory. I don't see how that should be possible when the game is playing with a full suite of players needs to be simpler or deeper with a redesign of the board for me to like it. Doesn't need to be simpler. This game is already very simple um, and it can be deep, but it's just not necessarily the type of game that it is, at least what this user is looking for. Um, it's, it's deep in that it, it, there's strategy involved and the more you play it, the better you can be at the game. So I would call it deep in that sense. Um, I avoided conflict in a five-player game for an easy victory. Basically, shouldn't be possible. <laughs> I, I would kind of agree. I mean, in a five-player game, you'd think everybody would be getting in each other's way. But certainly, and you can see it happen in a five-player game, but it's easier to see in a three-player game. If you have a three-player game, and you have two people who are constantly going back and forth and back and forth, and one person is just getting tons of duchies on the other half of the board, just without any conflict, they might win. Right, and this is a, that's the sort of game that, through repeated plays, you're going to see that a little bit better. Surprised that that happened to this user in a in a five player game, but again, if two players are hurting each other, two players are hurting each other, and one player is off doing their own thing. A lot of games can be like that, especially games with conflict. I own and have played more than twenty Knizia games. This is the one I like least. I like his game so much in general that I sometimes have to get this one out and set it up just to convince myself that it really is as annoying as I remember. Um, yeah, I wish this user went into more detail as to why he didn't like it. But overall, like, I mean, the ratings on this I see here are 6.6. So it's not very good. It's, it's a really average rated game <laughs> in a lot of people's minds. It is one of Knizia's older games. Um, and I'm kind of surprised it doesn't have more love um, because, you know, Tigris and Euphrates is one of Reiner Knizia's most celebrated game designs. And this is, I mean, it's not very similar, but a lot of the things that people say they like about Tigris and Euphrates, this game also has. I would play this over Tigris any day, just because it's a little bit easier to grok. It's a little bit easier to understand what's going on and to see the state of the board and to go like, okay, I'm, I'm worried about my position there, but I think I have a shot at taking that duchy there and you know, hoping you get the cards you need, and if you don't, working with what you get. I mean, it's, it's a really uh, positive experience. Um, I would love for there to be a new version of this, but this old version, if you can find it, works great. It's got some cool little uh, Duke pieces, little plastic pieces. The rest are discs. The board art is fine. Like, it's, it's perfectly serviceable, right? Um, definitely a, a modern production could, could uh, Pump, pump that presentation up a notch, but the game design itself is really solid and is a worthy board gem. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Rhinelander don't stop being good just because new games come out.
Take care.